Support for this mattering is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Their products are precision engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package, the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code SMATTERING it's at manscaped.com. Jeff, if my math is correct, that's about 16 million balls. Now, Jeff, I'll, I'll tell you, men don't always like to talk about these sorts of things, but as a younger man, I may have kind of had some experiences getting a little bit too close, using the wrong tools for the job, so to speak, in working on that below the waist trimming. And I can tell you, there's nothing worse than going out for a round of golf or playing basketball and you've gotten a little bit close to the skin. I can tell you, with the Manscaped products we're going to talk about with the Lawnmower 4.0, we're going to talk about that more. I don't have that problem now. So the Performance Package 4.0 has arrived and it is a game changer. Jason, what is in the Performance Package 4.0? So I just mentioned the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. You see it right here on the screen if you're watching on our YouTube channel. You're also gonna get, Jeff, you wanna hold up the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer there. You also get the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. I gotta say, I love the fun names they have with their products. You get the Crop Reviver Toner, some really comfortable performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag. It's a nice travel bag, it really is. So again, let's talk about the lawnmower 4.0. Eh, the trimmer, they say it's the future of grooming. And you know what? I say it's the greatest ball trimmer ever. And you know what? It does okay on the beard too, if you don't mind a little double duty. So that fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 4,000K LED spotlight you need for a more precise shave. Here's the light, and people. There's Put the light. The screen. Let me tell you, if you shave in the dark, it'll change your life. And because the trimmer is waterproof, you can say goodbye to the mess on the bathroom floor. And if you thought that was good, but you also want to take your grooming game even further to the next level, the Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. This trimmer is also waterproof and provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps reduce nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate nose holes. I'll tell you, when I got my Weed Whacker trimmer, I sent a picture of it to Jeff with the caption, I will make this thing cry robot tears, and it proved me wrong. If it can handle my nose and ears, it's going to be able to handle yours too. So a couple other products in there, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Ball Toner, it's going to change the way you approach your hygiene routine. Trust me when I say this, fellas, your balls will thank you. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts for to the uh, Performance Package 4.0, those Manscaped boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort and boxers to another level, people. So it is time to take care of yourself. So go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with code SMATTERING. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code SMATTERING. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Smattering where we ask the important questions about investing. I'm Jason Hall, joined by the voice of the people, Jeff Santoro. That is his name. That is what I'm calling him. How are you, Jeff? Hey, I'm doing well. Good to see you. You too. You too. You know, we mentioned a couple of times back to the regular routine of the kids in school and work is normal. It's been really nice. I feel really productive and the timing is really good for us to do a mailbag question because we got a bunch of questions that we're going to answer today, Jeff. Yeah, this has been one of our better mailbag responses when we've reached out and asked for people to send us questions. So thank you to everyone who sent them. Uh, please remember that we do this around once a month. So if you think of anything throughout the time that you're listening to the podcast, don't hesitate to email or, or DM us because we'll keep a running list of those questions and we'll ask them next time around. Before we jump into the mailbag, Jason, some quick housekeeping notes for everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to the almost dozen of you that gave us ratings on either 
the podcast, the Spotify or the Apple podcast app, or maybe both over the last couple of weeks. We've been reminding everyone each time we do an episode to please help us out, give us a rating, uh, give us um, a review if you can. And we've gotten a bunch more. In fact, we got a new Apple podcast review from Sly Guy 007 a couple of days ago. So thank you, Sly Guy. Uh, if you want to get a shout out on the podcast, leave us a review. Uh, it has to be a positive one or we're not going to read it. But all kidding aside, thank you for those that have been doing that. Please uh, help us out. If you haven't yet, give us a star rating, give us a review. And another reminder that we have a newsletter that we put out uh, twice a week. On Saturday, you get a transcript of the show. On Sunday, you get random thoughts by Jason and I. So if you're enjoying the podcast, you want a little extra content, go ahead and subscribe to that. Uh, then we have you on our list. And if anything, if we add any additional content or moving forward, that'll be the place to find it. So, all right, that's the housekeeping. So Jason, we got podcast mailbag questions to answer here. Why don't we dive into the first one? I will read it to you and I'll give you first shot at it and then I'll add my thoughts. So this is from Bonnelly and it came via email. And Bonnelly writes, all things unchanged. I don't see a reason for an investor, in quotes, to hold cash for long term in a high yield money market account. One would be paying taxes annually on the gains at your current tax bracket, diminishing the compounding effect. I'd be better off investing or holding fill in the blank offering uh, a, fi a fill in the blank offering a four to five percent yield and not paying taxes until re re retirement requires me to cash in. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I have a lot of thoughts about this. I think it's really it's a really good question because we have talked more about cash lately. Um, going back to even this spring um, on the YouTube channel, Tyler and I did a video. I think when we saw um, money market yields, which are basically T-bills, right? It's treasury rates is really what it is. Go like over four, four and a half percent. We started talking about it more. And I think the key thing is thinking about this from the perspective when you're talking about taxes and tax efficiency and inefficiency, it's, 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 I, I, I agree. I don't think people should hold cash for the long term. And if you think about a money market, it's essentially, it's, it's, a, it's a cash equivalent thing, right? Because money markets, these 30-day T-bills that they generally are, these short-term treasuries, it's as safe as cash, right? Um, and they're very, very liquid. But I agree, in general, unless you're talking about short-term needs where a cash-like thing makes the most sense, you know, and that's for most people is within the next year, right? Within the next few years, you know, you want to have some sort of a cash equivalent thing. You're kids about to graduate from high school and you're going to be paying college the next three to five years, you know, having a cash equivalent makes sense. And you want that generally, it's probably going to be in a taxable brokerage uh, or taxable account, unless you have like a 529 or a covered L or something where you still get some tax shielding. And that's the thing that I wanted to address is, is uh, Bonley was talking about the yield, four or 5% yield on a dividend on a, from a stock versus earning the four and a half to five and a quarter percent yield you can get on a treasury right now. The instrument doesn't matter. It's where you hold it. Because if you own Coca-Cola, you're, you're still going to pay taxes on that dividend if you own it in a taxable account. And you don't need to have a money market account to own money markets. For example, if I use Fidelity, right? That's my brokerage. I have it set up in my account that if I have cash, it's invested in SPACs, I think is what the S-P-A-X-X. It's a fund. It's a money market fund. I get over a 5% yield right now, but it's inside my retirement account. So it's not taxed. So, but, so I think so two things. Number one, think about where you're holding it to create the tax advantage situation. Makes a ton of sense. I agree with Bonnelly's main point. Holding cash for the long term doesn't make sense. I'm less concerned about the tax efficiency than the return efficiency. The bottom line is people are falling in love with a 5% yield for long-term financial needs, right? It doesn't make sense to go to all cash ever unless you're, you're going to be spending that cash in the next few years. You know, if you're talking 5, 10, 20 year plus returns, yeah, it doesn't make sense to be cash because again, even at 5%, it's, it's well below the market's historical returns for stocks. So again, think less about the, think about the asset for what is it what does it do? For, what is its job, right? And T bills and cash are short term hedges with some yield. Equities are long term growth, potentially with yield as part of that growth. And then the account is where you put it based on getting the most tax efficiency over the long term, whatever the goal is for that money. Did I say that well? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was thinking too. It, it is those two things it's where do you keep it? And 
And also, what is the purpose? I know like, so yeah. for example, and I think you, you said this, but just the one thing that I wanted to reiterate is keeping cash for short-term needs is now way less painful because in the short term, yes, you're going to pay taxes on the, on the interest, but you're actually going to get a yield on your, on your cash. Like, so for example, I have a kid in high school, uh, who's a sophomore, so I need to, I'm very close to be, to paying for college. You know, I have my 529, but I have more cash in a high yield savings account than I used to because I wanted it out of the market because I wanted it safe. If the market tanks when he's a senior and I was planning on that money to pay for college, now I'm in a bad spot. So I wanted a little extra money in cash. It's just sitting on the side, getting whatever I'm getting, 4.5% in my high yield savings account, and it's going to be there to help pay for college. So I think the, the nice thing now is you're no longer disincentivized to keep cash for those short-term needs three to five years. All right. So we got two questions from Dan via email, one directed at you, Jason, and one directed at me. So I'll read the one that he directed at you. Um, it's long, so I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit here, Dan, just for the sake of listeners. So uh, Dan says, Jason, I was wondering if you'd ever taken a close look at new holdings, ticker symbol NU, Given your positions in SoFi and Mercado Libre, I thought it might be one that's in your wheelhouse. If you have looked into it, your perspectives would be an interesting topic of conversation. I recently put it on my watch list, and for me, some green flags include, and there's a bunch of green flags here, so I'm just going to choose a couple. Strong growth rates around 60% year over year, high net promoter score, high glass door ratings. Uh, Dan really likes the mission statement, which is fight complexity to empower people in their daily lives by reinventing financial services. There's a bunch more. Then there's some potential red flags he lists as well. Inability to hit growth rates in Colombia and Mexico, potential saturation in, in Brazil, political risk, regulatory risk, economic risk. So basically all the risks you'd see in that part of the world. So that being said, those green flags, those red flags, Jason, what are your thoughts on uh, on new, yeah. So I'm f I'm familiar with New Bank, and you know I've I've read one or two of their earnings presentations in the past, but I have never taken a deep dive. And I guess one way to paraphrase it is, Jeff, you remember when we had Bill Mann on a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about how with Mercado Libre, you know th these different countries that it operates in, talked about the risk of those countries, but how Mercado Libre is less risky than those investing in those countries, right? Because of the way its business is diversified and what they've established and that kind of thing. So when I bought uh, Mercado Libre, it, I mean, the, the fintech aspect of it was, I'm sure somebody was talking about it, right? I'm sure even back then they were trying to figure out some way to grease the skids and make it easier for people to spend on a digital platform in these cash-based economies. Um, but I trust Mercado Libre now, um, their payments business and their lending business and the things that they do because of their track record, right? And because it's not their pure play, it's a part of what they do. And they're not trying to be a bank, right? Exactly in the same way that when we say SoFi or Bank of America or whatever, right? We think of banks. So thinking about new bank versus SoFi, I understand the US bank regulatory environment. I understand the US banking system. I understand US banks. It's very different. Um, when you move outside of the U.S. and Europe, there's some similarities between Europe and U the U.S. and Canada. Canada's banking system is extremely regulated, even far more regulated than, than banks are in the U.S. Um, the lack of regula regulation in a lot of Latin America, I don't want to say it concerns me, but it's, it's just it's kind of in my too hard pile, I guess is the way to put it. And I've never taken the time to look there. Again, SoFi, I would have to think is just infinitely safer than many banks are that operate in other parts of like Latin America, just because there's a regime in place to protect depositors um, that may not be as strong in other, in other places. So with that said, going back to Bill Mann, you know, Bill Mann and another colleague of ours, a friend who knows international markets very, very well, also Mexico, at the top of his list. Companies that have exposure to some of those markets that really could explode over the next 10 years as the US becomes less Asia centric and Europe becomes less Asia centric with things like supply chain. I feel like I do need to be more exposed to the future of those economies. So at some point, I'm going to give New a look. Just never, I don't have enough 
belief in my own ability to really evaluate banks because I get too optimistic with companies. I really do, Jeff, and I know that about myself. And sometimes when you're talking about something like a bank, which can be amazing until it just absolutely explodes spectacularly, right? Sometimes it's best for me just to not even, not even fish in those waters. So I don't know this company at all, other than I've heard the ticker a few times, but there's a couple of things that I was thinking about when I read the question, but also with what you said. What I think is great about this from Dan is that he's got a very specific list of green flags and red flags that he's identified. So yeah. what I would what I would do, Dan, if it were me and I had those lists, keep them written down somewhere. And every time there's news that you get from the company, a quarterly filing, the annual report, a press release, whatever, read it and read it with the critical eye of how does this align with or go against my green flags and my red flags? Am I seeing evidence of the things I'm worried that are risks manifesting themselves? Or am I seeing some of the things I had identified as green flags starting to erode? And then, so you're sort of thinking critically every time there's information, not Twitter hype, not someone's opinion, but information from the company that helps you verify those green flags and red flags. And the second thing I was thinking was, this is where having some sort of thought process around position sizing can be really helpful. So maybe you are interested enough that you take a small position and that you define what that means for you, whether it's a dollar amount, a percentage of your overall portfolio, and you add as you build conviction. So maybe the next quarterly report comes out and the green flags look greener, the red flags look less red, and you buy a little more or vice versa. You see some more concern, you see some risks manifesting themselves and you either hold or sell. So that's just another way I, how I would approach it if I was interested in a company that I was just learning about and had those specific green flags and red flags already sort of figured out. Jeff, before I ask you Dan's question that he had for you, there's one other thing I want to mention here is Berkshire own, they made about a billion dollar investment in new banks super early. I don't, I think they were after the IPO, they bought shares on the market. They may have been a pre-IPO investor. Anyway, they, they have a stake here. And sometimes that's the kind of thing that can cause people to say, oh, this is fine. This is safe. I could, this is a, and I think that's a really false trail, can be really dangerous to go down. And it's a, there's another thing too that's important. Um, Berkshire Hathaway has a really big advantage in a place like Brazil. Um, there's, a, there's a hedge fund called 3G Capital that they've done a lot of deals with that they, ha they know. They know the, the, the operators there. They know the investors at, at 3G Capital pretty well. And sometimes you just know somebody that knows a lot and Maybe there's, I don't want to say borrowed conviction, but that's insights that Warren Buffett can have based on experts in the region, in the market that you've done deals with, that you trust, that could have played a role in that decision, right? So all of a sudden that's like fourth hand conviction. So just be careful about because somebody else did it, it makes sense to do. Okay. So Dan's question for you, he says, Jeff, I'm interested to know if you found it difficult to keep conviction during a bear market so early in your individual stock investing journey, did you struggle to add to your positions on the way down and trust a long-term process for which you hadn't yet seen decades of, su of success uh, to fall back on? And then uh, Dan goes on to kind of explain some of the things he dealt with, like being swayed by media opinions when trying to find that extra conviction, trying to time the market, you know, instead of just regularly putting cash work, something you and I've talked about a lot with your process. So Dan says he'd really be keen to hear your experience, lessons learned, and what tools you added to your toolbox to help during those tough conditions. And what would you do same or differently the next time? Because there's always the next time. So this is a great question, Dan. And the first thing I thought of when I read it was, I have felt every single one of the things you wrote in this email. I think what helped me not make too many bad decisions, and I say too many because I certainly did make bad decisions, was a couple things. I started with very small amounts of money. I mean, comically small amounts of money. So in the very early days, nothing was really going to kill me. My entire, my entire portfolio of stocks probably could have gone to zero and it would have sucked, but not like completely altered my future. The, but I think the biggest thing that I, that I think is important to add it for context is I, even though I'm only a stock picker for three years, I've been through a lot of this stuff before because I'm 44. So I remember what it was like to see my retirement account 
crater in the great financial crisis and take several years to come back. You know, so I was always sort of cognizant of what was happening in in the world, and and I was and I'm old enough to know that there's times when the market does poorly and there's times when the market does great. So I I think that helped as a as a base. Now I'm just lucky that I was a little bit older when I did this. If I were a new investor in individual stocks when the when we went through all the last couple of years, I don't know. I might not have been um, able to handle it as as well as I think I did. I also remember very specifically during the crazy run up after the pandemic, thinking to myself, this cannot be right. <laughs> because every single day everything went up. And I and I just was like, this is it it's one of those if it's too good to be true, it probably is things. And I just so that was my thought the whole bull market. And then I also remember thinking, man, if I only knew what I do now when the market crashed in March of 2020, I would have bought so much more. So it's like you're, I was constantly building experience and using it to sort of steel myself against the next thing so that when we finally did hit the, the bear market, I was actually, in addition to feeling a lot of the feelings you wrote here, Dan, I was actually also kind of excited because I felt like it was my chance to capitalize on great companies that were now trading for much lower prices. And I think the last thing, and this is just the way I am, I'm, a, I'm pretty skeptical and cynical and contrarian by nature. So that I believe helps me a little bit to not get pulled into hype generally. And that helps on both ends of the market. That helps when it's going up and it actually helps when it's going down because I think it keeps me more even keel. So I think the last thing I would say is I also found a very good network of friends in investing and also podcasts to listen to and sources of information that I trusted to be trustworthy. And that also helps a lot. So talking to people, if, if our podcast can help people keep a level head during rougher times, I think that's also a really valuable tool. You just have to be careful and you know, what you listen to, what you read, to try to find sources that are not trying to sell you something or not trying to convince you that something's going to the moon or that the market's going to crash. Just even-keeled advice. And there's a lot of good mindset stuff out there now that I think can really help investors. Not, none of them better than the smattering. I Correct. Think. I mean, this is, this is number one, but right. there's some other ones too. Yeah, a couple. They're, they're, they're mediocre, but they're, they're around. I'll I'll add one thing to that, Jeff. I think one of the things that was Im kind of impressive for me is with with you is building a process, right? And figuring out what about that process work that help support healthy decision making, right? And and staying and kind of seeing the process through. I want to say trust the process. That's way too sports driven kind of thing, but you kind of did, right? And and I think that's that's impressive and it helps you find like the balance. I think that was really good. I, I want to add a little thing here too that's I'm, I'm borrowing some experience from somebody else who's, you know, same kind of same as you. You know, I was going through the financial crisis. That's really when I first started investing, um, particularly as an individual investor. I had kind of aggressively started putting in my 401k starting in probably 06, probably around 05 or 06. But really buying stocks, picking stocks was like 08, 09, which was very, very good timing. I got pretty lucky with that. And then going through this, yeah, the 2020 drop was very much licking my chops, right? I was, this is one of those, you know, once every 10 year, 20 year kind of opportunities. So, but talking to a common friend of ours, whose name I'm not going to sh share his experience in going through the 2020 crash. And he said, in a lot of ways, it was so much more difficult because when he went through the crash back during the global financial crisis, you know, he was younger, did not have kids, had the, 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 the work he did actually created more income opportunities for him, uh, some legal work that he did in M&A that created more opportunities. And when the pandemic happened, had two young kids and had moved into a kind of a semi-retired status, living partly off of investments, and then doing some other freelance work kind of on the side while his wife was the primary earner working for a nonprofit, right? And it was terrifying, absolutely terrifying being in that because 
the effects of the market, but also everything that's happening in the real world, right? And I think sometimes with a lot of the mindset stuff, with the stock stuff, everybody's really good about looking at a chart and showing you a picture of a chart in an article showing you March 9th, 2009 and saying, this was the best day. And you know, or from this date, this stock has gone up, whatever. And it's like, yeah, in March 2009, you weren't going to buy that bank stock because guess what? All the banks were failing, right? Or who was going to be buying a consumer goods company back then? Who was buying Apple back then? You know, it was, there's, there's what the stock did and then there's the what it was actually like in that environment. So it's always going to feel different and your life situation is going to play a big role in a lot of how it feels to you. So like Jeff's process, I want to circle it back to that, Jeff. Having that process is one of the things that helps a lot. And you have to evolve your process over time to account for changes in your life. Yeah, the, my process helped me a lot because, but I'm a process person, so that's partially a, a personality thing. But God, it's I so also, annoying. but I also I mean, was, it's great. but I also was all. It was also I, I wasn't stuck in it either, and that's another yeah. thing we talk a lot about, right? Mm -hmm. Frameworks, not rules. So I was open to tweaking, and I have tweaked it. I've talked about it on this podcast for the past year plus. You know, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll read the next question is we we have another mutual friend, John Rotanti, who has been on the pod, and he says this all the time on Twitter. You know, basically, your biggest investing superpower is completely having no FOMO. Yeah. Right. Like yep. having no FOMO is one of the best strategies you can have as an investor because it really it keeps the emotions out of it and it keeps you from doing dumb things. All right. Uh, next question. This comes from Ken on Twitter. Should I even be messing around in cyclicals? Not asking for advice, but I own STLD and Wire W I R E and ATL. ATI. I don't know. ATI. Sorry, ATI. All solidly in the green since last summer slash fall. I like the businesses and know enough to understand that I'm playing in a game that I do not understand well enough. There are plenty of ways to make money and I don't have to make it in these stocks. Each of these companies has performed well, but I don't know how long it will continue or how strong tailwinds from infrastructure building and electrification can take their respective sectors. Small positions, I could take gains and distribute into something that's a pure long-term holding. Assuming I have time to follow closely, what advice on my, or mindset would you give me? Obviously not advice on positioning, just the way of thinking and risks, et cetera. Yeah, cyclicals are, are interesting, right? Because it's really cyclical stocks. You almost have to buy them counter-cyclically. Um, Tyler and I did a video looking at um, some lithium stocks. And lithium is lithium market prices are way down. There's a ton of excess in inventory that got built up. It's kind of just everything slowed down in China. So it's that's weighing on on the sector. But then you think about lithium and like everything that's happening with electrification and like it is a massive demographic trend. It is a massive long-term tailwind. So there's the cyclical realities and then there's the long-term tailwinds, right? So you have to kind of be mindful of that with these companies because you can fall into value traps pretty easy. STLD, that's Steel Dynamics is an example. This is, I think it's basically the newest steel company founded in the US in the past like 50 years. Um, they have a really interesting process that works well and their ability to grow and take market share I think is really, really good. So it's a little bit of a growth story there. But then if you look at the stock, I haven't, you know, haven't looked at it in a few weeks, I know at one point recently it was pretty close to all time highs, but then you look at it on a multiple, like on a valuation, and it looks really cheap. And if we're near the like the peak of the steel cycle right now, that's a it's a false val it's a value trap, right? Because you're going to end up you, you what looks like a cheap valuation is actually an expensive stock if steel demand does kind of fall or if steel pricing falls. So I think with these steel companies and other cyclicals. You very much want to be very, very mindful of when you're when you're buying, and you certainly want to buy when the the market is capitulated, right? And the stocks have fallen, and everybody's kind of given up. And sometimes you do kind of have to sell and be disciplined as a seller too. I have a very small amount of steel dynamics that I've not been able to talk myself into selling, even though the valuation has concerned me because of of those reasons. But I think there's plenty of other cyclicals that are just kind of low growth, no growth ones. That you can make money almost kind of in a trade where you buy when the market is turned and all of the negative sentiment is there, but whatever the underlying 
product is and the end markets that it serves, you know there's growth and you know there's things are going to return. You can ride that wave back up for a few years and then you sell and capitalize. Are you going to time the market perfect and get the bottom and the top and all that stuff? No. But again, it gets back to Jeff. We've talked about like like getting uh, uh, the, what was the rate of return? What was the, I'm just uh, an acceptable rate of return. You kind of, you're doing the same thing, right? This is very much not the long-term mindset buy and hold. Some, some cyclicals are great long-term buy and holds, right? Like Nucor, you could have bought it back in the eighties and, you know, thousands and thousands of percent gains. But generally with most of these cyclicals, you have to buy them cheap, ride the wave back up, and then you sell when everybody else is excited about them and you do whatever you want to do with that capital to reallocate it in other ways. I, it's, it's kind of somewhere in between trading and long-term buy and hold. Cyclicals are kind of their own thing. You need to understand the industries, you need to understand the dynamics at play, and you need to figure out how to really appropriately evaluate and value the companies. Yeah, I, I avoid them entirely because they just seem ex like an exhaustingly, yeah. it's just a lot of work. Yeah, you, that's and, a perfectly reasonable approach yeah. too. You don't have to, like Lou, Lou Whiteman, the show that he came on and did with us talked about, you don't, it's not like you're not the giants where you have to play every team on your schedule, right? You get to choose what you put on your schedule and do. Yeah. To me, to me, I think you'd have to either, I'll speak for myself, for me to be interested in buying cyclicals, two things would have to be true. I would have to really understand the industry in which I'm buying that cyclical stock, like steel, the steel dynamics one. I'd have to really understand the steel industry. And I would have to really be interested in it because in my mind, it's going to take a lot of mental energy to be staying up on the quarterly reports, having the specific things I'm looking for. And I think the third thing is it, you really have to have a, a, an iron constitution, a steel constitution yeah. to yeah. sell when everyone's excited about it mm -hmm. and buy when everyone hates it. Yeah. And I think that's, you're just, you're asking for a lot of work and you're asking to, you're asking yourself to do what's hard to do, which is go against the grain. It consistently over many years to to make any profits, and I just feel like I'd rather put that money in a stock that I can not have to spend that much time thinking about. But to each his own. But that's how I think about it. I agree. All right, most, most people shouldn't do it. I agree with you a hundred percent. Chris, all right, Chris got some good questions here for us. Yeah, all right, we got two from Chris on Twitter, um, and they're related, so I'll just read them right off the bat and see what you think about them, Jason. Question one: Which three current positions do you own that you believe could generate the strongest returns by the end of twenty twenty four? And the second question, which industry or sector do you believe has the greatest potential for shareholder returns by the end of 2024? So I'm going to piss Chris off because I'm immediately going to give a non-answer answer. Anybody that tells you what they expect, which sectors or which stocks can give the best return over the next 15 months, I think we're talking about at this point. Yeah, they're guessing. They're just telling you because they were asked. Chris, so that's the caveat. I'm answering this because you asked it, not because I really, I really know. I'm going to answer it backwards too. And I'm going to say that I think one area that did that video with, with Tyler, I think that lithium stocks are one of those kind of situations where there's opportunity. The, some of the best stocks and their good companies are down 30, 40, 50% from their highs. Lithium's really beaten down. There's a ton of negative sentiment. I think a year from now, that probably will have started to turn some. And, and those kind of stocks are probably going to do pretty well. But if you were to ask me that about like Apple or any of the, the mega cap stocks, I don't, I don't necessarily know that that's, that's going to be the case. So you know what that's going to mean, Jeff? The mega caps are going to do incredibly well over the next 15 months and lithium's going to go sideways, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, so I don't have a good answer to either of these only because... The only time I've ever thought in that short of a time frame was when we started the portfolio contest in December, because we were specifically picking stocks for a year's contest. And I'll be honest, my thought process during that would be the same I would apply here, which is I would find companies I own that I still have a lot of conviction in that are still just really beaten down. Because that's really all I did when I picked my three for the portfolio contest. I picked Amazon because it was stupid cheap compared to where it has been. And it was just, it, we were just talking a few minutes ago about in cyclicals, you have to buy when everyone's against it. And it felt in December of 2022 that everyone was sort of counting Amazon out and pointing to its 
you know, operating losses and how much money it was burning and fix, you know, trying to fix all of the invest over investment in that they had to make during the pandemic. And everyone was just kind of sour on the business. And I was like, well, I think Amazon is still Amazon and it's cheap right now. So I added it to my portfolio. Not a super sophisticated thing. It was basically playing the market, you know? And I think in the short term, that's what you're doing. Like you said, it's a guess. So if you're going to guess, guess a good company that's beat up. Because you know, just you know, in that short time frame, you probably have a just as good of a chance, if not better, than anything else to have a good year. But it also might not work. I never would have guessed Meta or Tesla, the two stocks I picked for our unportfolio. I picked them because I didn't like them, but I also picked them because I honestly didn't think they were going to have great years, and there was reasons I gave for that back in December, and I was a thousand percent wrong. I, I never, I thought Meta's year of efficiency was nonsense coming out of Zuckerberg's mouth. And he ended up actually making the business more efficient. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't have a better answer than that. I'm going to give here based on based on that formula, based on that framework. I'm going to offer up to Jeff, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on it here. So the same idea, starting with a good business part, right? I think they have a good business. They have a good product. They have good execution potential for great execution potentially for a very large market share. The stock happens to be beaten down right now. Outset Medical and Upstart, you know, I think are two. So I'll let you talk about Outset and why you think that might be the case. I think you wrote about it in your last week's uh, words on our newsletter that came out when, uh, this last Sunday. But Upstart, I'll give as an example. We've seen them be profitable. They've shown they can be profitable when volume is there, right? When, when the lenders are actually lending unsecured loans and it's executing, uh, the, the, then, then they can make a ton of money on the fees for that sort of thing. So a year from now, concerns about the economy and have kind of gone to the wayside and maybe we've gone through a recession and things are coming through it, right? And everything's looking, looking good for a year plus from now and lenders are using the platform more and like whatever's going on with interest rates, people have just kind of like we have some, like there's still a lot of uncertainty about it, interest rates. Like there's a camp that still believes they're going to fall and a larger, larger and larger cohort saying, no, they're, they're not. They're going to be where they are for an extended period of time. All those things could be good, good known quantity things for Upstart, and this is a stock that's still down like sixty three percent from its all time from its all time high. Could do really, really well, you know, in a in a more normal environment where banks are just using their platform. Now, Outset is kind of an execution story at this point. Yeah, I wrote about it in the newsletter that went out just this past Sunday because it's one of the ones I worry about because I, I love it so much. And I've, I really do think that it's early. And as long as they keep selling their machines, they're going to be okay. But I could be wrong. So that's why it's always, you know, and the market's down on it. I feel like every day this past week, I've been getting an alert that it's at a new 52-week low. Um, there's been two times in the past 15 months where pauses or, or, or stops of selling certain things for, F, for extra FDA approvals have really chopped the stock down. But in one in one case, it was just a f several weeks, and then it was right back out. And they're in the middle of one of those right now. They even stopped selling a certain part of the machine, even though they didn't have to, just to cross all the t T's and dot all the I's with the FDA. So in my mind, those are blips in the road of a young company. And if it ends up being a super successful winner two decades from now, no one no one's going to look back and remember these two little blips on the radar back in 2022 and 2023. So, you know, again, that's an early stage medical device company that already has FDA approval and has the market, has a product on the market. So it's just a execution game at this point. How many people can they get to use their device and can they get economies of scale and turn profitable? Um, does that happen by the end of 2024? No idea. That's not why I own it. But if I were trying to pick a short time frame, I would look for those sorts of things. So Austin has two questions that are kind of in my alley. Just combine them together, Jeff. They're basically one question. Yeah. So the two from Austin are, with a dividend yield of nearly 7%, what do you think of Next Era Energy Partners for a long-term investment? If you had to pick three financial metrics to assess the investment thesis or health of this company, what would they be? And then the next question is, is Next Era Energy, N-E-E, -E, or Next Era Energy Partners, N-E-P, a better buy? What are some of the pros and cons of each investment? What metrics would you use to assess the investment thesis of each company? It's it's funny. I've I've mentioned some of the videos on our, our YouTube video, the short term, the short short form videos we do. 
that I've, I've done a ton with Tyler lately. I've mentioned him a ton on this on this episode, Jeff and Austin. We actually recorded um, a video specifically about this, and we also talked about Brookfield Renewable as well. And I think it's really important to understand the to answer your question. What is next year energy partners? And it's really like a finance vehicle is the best way to think about it. So you've got next year energy, which is the parent company, which is a utility, right? And one of the things that utility companies do to some degree, some do, is they have like these master limited partnerships that they use as ways to finance more deals and like to bolster their own balance sheet, right? So if you're next year energy, you've got your regulated business, Florida Power and Light. You have your unregulated business, which is a lot of utilities and some other things where you're producing power and selling it to other utilities and to large power users, right? So it's, that's the difference between regulated and unregulated. And the way they've been, one of the ways they've been able to grow their unregulated utility business is with next year energy partners. Because what they do is they'll, they'll, they'll build these renewable energy assets and then they drop them down to next year energy partners. And what that means is they sell it to the, to next year energy partners, next year energy partners, yeah, next year energies, they own a controlling stake. So they get the same dividend as investors do, right? So they get that yield. They still have control of the asset. So it's a way for them to kind of deleverage the parent company's balance sheet while still pursuing growth, right? In this unre unregulated business. Here's the problem. A higher yield is a problem is, is, it actually undermines the thesis and the usefulness of next year, in a, next year energy partners um, as a finance tool. Because if you're going to acquire one of these assets from the parent company, you're either going to use cash, which they don't keep much cash on the books. They turn the cash over pretty quickly. You're going to take on, take on debt or you're going to issue stock, right? And basically what the, with a 7% yield, they pretty much have to take on debt. And there's just not much meat left on the bone because you look at the rates of return on most of these assets, they're mid to high single digit rates of return. So if you're issuing stock at, at a 7% yield to, to acquire an asset that's going to generate a 5 or 6 or 7% yield, the math doesn't work, right? It just it doesn't work. Um, so that's the issue. So I'm not even really going to get into metrics besides looking at the yield right now. And as much as that's attractive, to somebody looking to buy a dividend stock, and I know Austin, you love these yield codes. That high yield for 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 next year energy partners is bad. It's not conducive to the reason that it exists as a finance tool. Now it's different for Brookfield Renewable. Now, first of all, it has a lower yield, which is good, but Brookfield it, Renewable is not a drop down mechanism because its parent company, Brookfield Corporation, is not a utility, and its partner with a lot of its deals, Brookfield Asset Management. Again, also not a utility. It's a co-investment vehicle, right? So it exists to participate in the investment in these assets. You may have, Brookfield Asset Management may have a fund that invests in a renewable energy asset. And then Brookfield Renewable may also buy a stake in it. And then Brookfield Renewable can also be the operator, right? So, so it's not exactly the same reason that it exists. So... It's the same way with Clearway Energy, which is, I think, Global Investment Partners is the parent company. It's an investment fund. It's not a utility. And you've got Atlantica Sustainable Infrastructure, which is the parent company is a utility. So again, you, you have to think about them differently in terms of who control, controls it and what they're using it for. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm, I'm optimistic everything's going to be fine, but I think there is some risk. The next era energy just rolls it up. They just they they reacquire it and roll it up because you can't use it as a finance vehicle. The price is discounted. It's more attractive to just buy it back, right? So I wouldn't be in a hurry there. If I was buying a yield co right now, I'd, I'd be buying Brookfield Renewable. All right. So that's it for the questions, Jeff. Everybody that sent questions to us, much appreciated. Thank you very much. Let's take a break. I need a break, and then we'll be back for the second part of the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Smattering for the second part of our show where I ask Jeff the question, how are your market vibes, bro? Yes, this the segment we're calling, how are your market vibes, bro? Well, no, I, 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 this is why I wanted to talk about this because we have been on a pretty nice run from what, I, what would we say, like March-ish, April-ish of, I'm sorry, no, no, since, 
since October of 22, right? That's when the yep. low the low was. We've been on a pretty nice run from then up into about August. And then since then, it's kind of been heading back down, not in a straight line. But so we've been on this really nice run and everything's been feeling good. But the last couple months, it's just really, it's felt bear market-ish again, at least in my portfolio. So I just wanted to talk about it. I wanted to see how your head's been. The last couple of days have been a little bit rougher. I know today the market is up. We're recording this on the 25th while the market's still open. But it's interesting because I buy every week, I notice things like, oh, my this this my brokerage account is now down this amount. And two weeks ago, it was up that amount. Like I'm very cognizant of these like short-term shifts. I'm not worried about them because as we've said a bazillion times, we're both doing this for the long term. But I do notice it because I buy weekly. And so I'm looking at it all the time. I know you buy very much infrequently so you might not I, be I can't remember to it. it's weird I can't remember the last time I bought but I've talked about on the show a lot it's like you know I'm optimistic about people and businesses and companies but I'm terribly pessimistic about the economy like I, I pretty much ask me anytime and what I think about a recession and I'll, and I'll say yes there's going to be one and probably within a year and but I don't invest that way because it's proven wrong but that's that's it's funny because that exactly what you're talking about surprised me so here's the numbers right the actual numbers so January 4th, 2022, that was the all-time high for the S&P. And then it was, like you said, October was the bottom when we got to, it, like, I think it was June, we dropped below 20% and then had a pretty good month or two. Then it fell again, the market, I think, bottomed almost down 25% before it started really, really running up. And then, yeah, since August, I think we're down about 5%. So it's starting to feel kind of bearish again i well, guess the, the other place I, I noticed it that our listeners might notice is is go look at the smatterfolio go look at the click yeah. on the link in our in our show notes and just a few weeks ago we i was teasing you because i was finally had inched up a, you know i got above you for a couple of days and we were both up 30 something ish percent and now both of us are down from there and we've been saying every time we've yeah, done who's ahead you are probably ahead right now. I'm not looking at it, but can you say that again? <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. But I think it's funny because we've been saying all through the year, this has been a good year, and it was like January, or this has been a good year, and it was March. So I, I'm just curious. Like I wonder if the second half of the year might be trending down. I don't know. Again, I don't really change the way yeah. I invest because of those things, but these are things I wonder about. So I was just curious where your head was about it. Yeah, kind of the same vibes, which for me is not normal. Well, so here's one thing that I am doing that's certainly playing a role in this is my wife changed employers and we're rolling her 401k from her former employer. We're consolidating it into a single brokerage that we're going to use for to manage all of our stuff. Just It'll just be easier. And her existing, her prior, I should say, um, investment manager who will not be named because their lawyers are better than our lawyers, Jeff, is terrible when it comes to this kind of thing. Like they just make it really hard, unnecessarily hard. Like they actually mail checks and they send them to you and send it to your new brokerage. And it's just dumb. And it's going to take like two weeks to get the, to get the checks. And then we got to go to the brokerage and deposit. like, it's just, it's dumb. So I have been actually paying a little more attention Recently, because of that, and I can tell you, so I had to sell everything in the brokerage and move it to cash. I felt really smart because, you know, all of this stuff has happened with the market coming down. It's down like three or 4% since we liquidated those things. And we're mostly going to roll it back over into the same stuff. And I'm hoping I get really lucky and the market just continues to fall. I feel like a really horrible human being for saying that because a lot of people are going to be affected now in negative ways for us to benefit in a very tiny potential way. So here's my question, Jeff. I'm going to ask you for an actual prediction. So we've talked about our vibes a little bit. What do you think is going to happen? Again, we're down 5% roughly from the recent high. We're down closing in. This is 25th, by the way, September 25th. So it's by the time you hear this, it'll be a whole market week. So who knows what could happen? We're almost 10% down again from the all-time high. What's going to happen? What do you think? What is your prediction? Like actual prediction. You've given your vibes. What, are you, what is your prediction? 
I don't like making predictions. I will say two things. One is that on our reckless prediction show that we did back in December, I did say that there would be uh, that in, uh, inflation would improve and that we would not have a recession in 2023. That was my reckless prediction. So I'm sticking with both of those things because if I'm right, I'll, I'll be able to brag a little bit. So I'm going to say that I don't, if it get, if it goes further down from here over the last three months of the, of the year, I don't know that it will go drastically down. It's also difficult too, because there, and there's a ton of statistics or, or data to back this up. The market does poorly in September, just historically for whatever reason. So that that's also maybe playing into my vibes. You know, we're now I'm going to blame the children almost through. We're going to blame children, children in schools is the reason that there you go. There you go. But I will say this. So I always feel bad saying this because I, I understand if you're about to retire, you don't want to hear these words, but I kind of want it to go down more. You know, Warren Buffett says the same thing. Basically, if, if you if you are a long term stockholder, you should want the market to you know, go down and present you with better buying opportunities. And I want it to go up really strongly in the last couple of years before I, I retire and everyone else you're on your own. But, but there are, cause you know, it, it, I, I mentioned this earlier when we answered one of the mailbag questions, but I never, I don't, I have this, I, a little bit of hindsight bias where I wish I had bought a little more when the market was down more you know, tw hindsight's twenty twenty. So there's always part of me that sort of wants another crack at that opportunity. I'm, I haven't answered your question. I'm going to say that from here, so we're down. I was going to point that out if you didn't. Okay. I'm going to say that from here, September 25th to the end of the year, we will be no better or worse than we are now in terms of total return for the S&P 500 than 3% in either direction. So I think we're going to be Kind of middling yes. along. That's Such my prediction. Chicken shit That's my prediction. Is. That that is a prediction. Okay. Yeah. Well, all it's right. All right, one. tough guy. What's your prediction? And we'll 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 go back to this tape. I'm going to predict that the market is going to go sideways. That's what I just predicted. No more with it within three percent up or three percent down. Two point five percent up or down. Yeah. <laughs> No, Jeff, seriously, I, mean, I think that's a reasonable prediction. It really, really is. But I guess, I guess what we're going to find, because I do, I do tend to kind of agree with you, but I, I think what we're going to find is, number one, like what is the strength of the consumer economy? Because we're going to get into the holiday shopping se season, and that's so important for so many different kinds of businesses. And we're not going to learn much about the housing market because this is like, not a great part of the housing market anyway, right? In terms of new construction or people listing homes, right? So we're not going to get that answer. But I think that's one of the things the Fed wants to see is like, how strong is the consumer really? As we get into this really backloaded, heavily consumer spending driven part of the year. And that could answer some questions about what the Fed decides that it really does, does need to do. And then I think investors are going to overreact one way or the other based on whatever whatever that is. Well, here's another thing that I think might have been contributing to the down market we've had over the last couple of weeks or a couple of months is it really did seem like, and I've heard other people say this, this is not my analysis, that the market was pricing in some rate cuts, you know, even though there was really no evidence that there was going to be rate cuts. And this last Fed announcement last week, I think sent the message that, nope, Maybe we'll hold steady, but there won't be any cuts anytime soon. And right after that, the market sold off pretty significantly. So now where, yeah. I don't know where, if, if that's true, if that, if we shook out that belief from the market, I don't know if we are now equilibrialized, if that's a word, and it'll be kind of here on out, or if there's still more of that to come out. But I do think that that's something that the market does seem to you know, go higher or lower based on what it thinks will happen in the future with rate cuts. And if the market no longer believes cuts are in our immediate future, maybe all the sell-off is over and we're kind of here now. I don't know. Just another thing I've heard other people, other smart people say. Good vibes, bro. Good vibes. Well, however I feel about the market, Jason, I want you to know that I have good vibes about you and our podcast. How about that? We'll end on a positive note. Same. I appreciate that. I appreciate you. I also appreciate our listeners, and I want to remind our listeners that Jeff and I, oh man, that we love giving our answers to these hard questions about investing, but it remains up to you 
to give your answers. You can do it. I believe in you. All right, Jeff, we'll see you next time. See you next time.